Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are kicking it off module three, and this is Artifact One. In today's work, in today's fun, we are going to be looking at some of the art of the Proto Renaissance. When we think about the Renaissance, we often divide it into Italian and Northern. Um, those are the geographical designators, and we often think about early and later, or sometimes low and high. Um, but there is this very interesting transitional period in the Renaissance where we're doing things differently than what the medieval people were, but it's not quite the full-blown explosion of the Renaissance just yet. And so we often call this time frame the Proto-Renaissance. Um, sometimes it's called Italo-Byzantine, so Italo, Italy, and then Byzantine because it looks a great deal like the um, the Byzantine architecture of the East that we looked at in terms of halos and gold and flatness. And so it's this very interesting transitional period uh, in the um, in the, uh, the the Renaissance that will get us somewhere very cool very quickly. Now, if I were to ask you to name cities in Italy, you would probably get to Rome and Florence. You probably get to Pisa because of Leaning Tower. You might get to Milan and Venice, maybe even Naples. Um, but you likely don't know about Siena. And when talking about Italian Gothic architecture, we we looked at Siena ever so briefly. Siena is about two thirds of the way from Rome to Florence. Um, from Ro from Florence to Siena on the train is maybe. 45 minutes. Um, and most recently when I was there, we took a coach from Rome and it took us maybe about two hours to get there. I want to show you a map of Siena um, because of the ways in which Siena is, is made. It's really quite fabulous. It's really old. The streets are really, uh, really narrow. There are no cars. And so this right here is the city center that we looked at last time, right? So there it is. And over here is the cathedral, which we'll, um, which we looked at. The best piece of pizza I've ever had, let me see, get my bearings right, was off on a little side street over here. That was really tasty, one year old, boy, that was good. Um, but we're gonna think about this church and a painting that was intended for it. And so there's a number of very prominent artists who are working in Siena during the end of the 13th and into the 14th century. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at those art makers. We're also gonna talk about different types of art. So, cause right now we're gonna be dealing with more flat art and that is painting um, than sculpture and architecture, which has been the kind of thing that has largely occupied our efforts so far. Certainly painting exists in the ancient world. It just doesn't last 3000 years. It can last 800 years. And that's why we'll look at some of those things now. Now what you're looking at here is a painting. It's by an artist named Simabue. And the kind of painting is called a maista. And that is a fancy Italian phrase for a gigantic picture with Mary and a baby Jesus um, that may or may not have a whole bunch of saints standing around them. It's called a Maista. This work dates from right around 1280 and it's part of the Italian Proto-Renaissance. So this work is tempera on panel. Tempera on panel. Now, the panel part we've looked at before because the Jan van Eyck's painting was on panel, but this is painted on a wooden board, right? Planks of wood bound together, um, and the that is the support, right? So a painting has two parts, the support and then the media, or the medium is singular. So the support is what we're placing the pigment on. And the support can be all kinds of things, right? A support can be wood panel, it can be canvas, it can be paper, it can be glass, it can be your skin um, if you have dreams of a tattoo that you'll regret 10 years from now. All of those are supports. It's a surface upon which the pigment is applied. Now, paint has two parts, two parts. 
The first part is the pigment. The second part is the binder, pigment and binder. <laughs> so pigment comes from a variety of different places. One of those places is the natural world, right? So um, if you want a certain kind of green pigment, you can use, I don't know, a certain kind of plant that you grind up that releases that pigment, that dye. That's one of them, right? The, the purple, that imperial purple color that we've seen, that comes from a certain mollusk that is um, gotten out of the bottom of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, right? So that is a pigment. You can, you can grind up gemstones, that beautiful blue paint that we see is um, derived from ground up lapis lazuli. So that's the pigment. The binder is how we get that pigment to stick to the support, right? You can't just throw the pigment at the canvas. You gotta, cause the pigment's often a liquid or a dust. So you have to find another way to get it to stick. And that, and we usually refer to the kind of paint after the binder. So oil paint is pigment mixed with linseed oil. Acrylic paint is pigment mixed with acrylic. Fresco is pigment mixed with lime water. And tempera is pigment mixed with egg white. Okay, so this is a tempera painting. It's pigment mixed with egg white and it has gold leaf on it. So all of the gold that you see on this is a nugget of gold that has been pounded until it is um, microscopically thin and then adhesed onto the wooden board as a final step. Um, and that gold is so thin that if you were to put that gold leaf on your finger and rub it with your thumb, it would evaporate. Um, it's remarkably difficult to deal with for, for, for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that gold, like not to get all chemistry class on you, but gold's a heavy, gold is a heavy metal, right? And the bigger the number of its atomic number, the more electrons it has. And the more electrons it has, the more staticky it can get, right? Like there's more electrons that can develop a charge. And so because of this, gold leaf is really, really hard to deal with. I mean, Ask your teachers if they've ever messed with gold leaf. And the answer is either no or yes, and I hated it. It's a really, really hard thing to do. So this, this image has Mary seated with a, with a little baby Jesus on her lap. He's wearing purple, getting back to our mollusk. And she is flanked on each side by eight angels. And on the bottom side, there are um, four saints or prophets underneath it. So let's talk about the structure of this painting, and then we'll talk about what, about uh, who and what is there, and then maybe a little bit about space. A, my friends, is the wood panel. It's, it's a number of planks put together and sanded down until it's slick like a piece of ice. But paint does not stick to wood really well. So instead, the first coat is this, it's B. It's gesso. Gesso is a kind of plaster-based substance, usually, at least in the old days was, um, that sticks to um, wood really well. It's a kind of primer. So the first thing they would do after sanding the wood down was to be, was, would apply a, a coat of gesso. And the pigment up will stick to that really well. C here is the underdrawing. Back in the olden days, people sketched before they did stuff. And so they sketch things out. Here we have the back of the chair, the head of the Virgin, the head of the baby Jesus, the, head, the, the top of the throne, right? From there, we have our underpainting and then our final paint. And generally the gold leaf is added last. Now, if we were to think about this object itself, and if we were to imagine it as a three-dimensional object, um, we could talk about the shallow depth of field that we have here. And what I mean to suggest is that the, if the object that is closest to us is that which is lowest on the picture plane, and that is this line here, right? This is a vertical line. This is a vertical line. So this whole thing is the thing that's closest to us as viewers. The thing that's farthest away from us is this gold background here. 
if we were to make this a three-dimensional representation, what's the difference? And what's the depth from there to there? Like, and it's really impossible to guess, but it seems really shallow, doesn't it? That if we were to take this painting and rotate it 90 degrees and view it as a three-dimensional object, that all of these figures have been crammed into this really, really shallow picture plane. And yet, despite that yet shallow picture plane, we have Mary with Jesus and some angels. And aren't they all sort of stacked atop of one another? Right? They really are. Mary is wearing her red and blue uniform, which is something we will see quite consistently throughout this class. Um, they're the colors of the University of Arizona. So I like to joke that she went to it. She's a good Arizona girl. Jesus is wearing his red and purple. She wears red and blue because they're pure colors, right? If you're in an art class, they're primary colors. Can't be mixed, uh, can't be created by mixing any other colors. Jesus is looking at us. He's raising his right hand in that gesture of blessing that we've seen before. His ears look a little bit awkward, which is really unfortunate for our Lord and Savior. And he has been shown with a kind of baby body, right? Look at him. That's a wee little tyke there, isn't it? But a grown-up kind of head. Like in some ways, this is not just a baby. He looks to be much bigger. And Mary, you will see in successive paintings, she often looks the same. Her head kind of tilted to the left a little bit. I guess her left a little bit. This aquiline nose. This is the way Mary was shown between 1250 and 1333. And so it's a very standardized depiction of him. A slightly older kid head, although smaller baby body, right? It's a small head, but it doesn't look like a baby face, does it? Like, I've had two babies. I mean, I've like carried them around and everything. It doesn't look like a baby head. It looks baby head in size, but not baby head in, um, in proportions. They all have these gigantic gold dinner plate halos, right? And this will be one of the things that is a, a marker of the proto-Renaissance are these gigantic gold dinner plate um, halos that will change over the course of the next 200 years. Jesus looks out at us and he looks out at us with a sense of awareness, doesn't he? He's not like a baby. I mean, again, I've had babies. They look confused most of the time. He looks out at us as if he knows things. And this gets to a, a kind of an important idea behind the life of Christ. You might not have noticed at first, but in his right hand, can you see what he's holding? He's holding a scroll. He's holding a scroll that has writing in it. I mean, that's what scrolls are. Scrolls are bits of parchment with writing on them. And the suggestion of this is that Christ, this little itty bitty boy on his mother's lap is literate. He reads and writes, he's smart. And this gets to an idea that actually comes from St. Augustus, who wrote that even when Jesus was a baby, Jesus was a grown up as it pertained to his knowledge of, of God and the Father. That he might have been a three-year-old, but he might as well have been a the the theology, theology professor. And so we have, in this time frame, this kind of dual nature of Jesus. The baby body with a small head, but the head lo looks as if it belongs on a body um, infinitely, infinitely younger. I want to call your attention to something else interesting. And that is, first of all, Jesus' crazy big toe. But secondly... The lack of a lap for Mary. And if we were in a classroom together right now, I would demonstrate exactly what a lap is. You have a lap right now, I bet. Like the horizontal placement of your femur. And I don't know how long my femur is. Let's say it's two and a half feet. That If I sit down, there's at least two and a half feet between my knee and my hip socket. And I don't know where poor Mary's poor knee is. There's one of them, I suppose. I don't know if it's going to make it to her hip socket. And where her other knee is, is kind of a mystery. That there is a drastic lack of interest in the rendering of three-dimensional space. Certainly the gold background does this as well, right? It makes it seem as if we're in heaven rather than Siena. 
but there is not a real interest in creating of space on this object. And that is another marker of the proto-Renaissance. In, in 150 years, the interest in perspective is going to be so overwhelming that it's almost the reason why the painting exists. And here, in an object like this, there's just no interest in that. And so this is Simabue doing something really, really interesting. Um, Simabue has a contemporary who's working about the same time in Siena, and his name is Duccio. Duccio and, and Simabue are contemporaries of one another, both painting in Siena. And what you're looking at on the right-hand side is another uh, Maista painting called the Ruccelli Madonna. And on the left is an enormous altarpiece called the Maista altarpiece um, that has been, is what's called a polyptic. Poly is, uh, is an abbreviation for many and tick, polyptic. Um, is means altarpiece. And so this was made of many different panels. They've, they're all in different museums around the world. Um, and this work is huge. Actually, this work is huge too. I mean, to give you an idea of scale, oh golly, this is like eight feet tall, the Sumabue and, and the, the, the Duccio um, is maybe a little bit smaller, but not but in in but just a little bit they're both in a museum the museum in florence called the uffizi and so when you and they're in the same room so you can see how just enormous they are and the maista is even bigger it might not be as tall but it's certainly much wider and there are paintings both on the front side and then on the back side with things all along the top and on this prendella panel as well this thing was so big and so fantastic that when Duccio finished it and it was taken to the Cathedral of Siena, a building that you've seen before already, um, it was paraded through the streets like a national holiday. And we have people who we've recognized already, right? Mary, please note her head there. And look at this Mary's head here, tilted the same way aquiline nose and a little pudgy baby Jesus sitting on her lap. And around her sits a variety of saints and good people. For example, this is St. Catherine of Siena. She's actually shown with her head here, although it was cut off. She's holding the palm frond here of martyrdom. There's a detail of it. And here is a, uh, a, a, detail, a, a better image here of the of um, Mary and baby Jesus. And I got to tell you, doesn't Jesus look like a slightly better baby Jesus? I mean, he's like a little pudgy. He's doing like babyish kinds of things. Um, and this right here, I want to call your attention to. That is a highlight. And the reason there's a highlight is because there's a knee there. And although I don't want to suggest to you that there's some really fabulous things happening there, I do think it's true that Duccio is getting a little bit better at creating visual space and creating a three-dimensional object on something perfectly flat. That you get the idea that there's a real body here. Maybe not a perfect body, but still a real one. Underneath all of this, there's an inscription that pretty much said Duccio painted this for the cathedral at Siena um, at, in 1308 to 1311. So, hooray. I'll give you one more. And I just want you to look at the head by the scariest baby Jesus you're going to see today, by the way. So look at this one and look at that one. And actually, I'll make it really easy on you. Let's do this. Don't you get the idea that's the same Mary? Now, this is a really fascinating object. This is now at the Met in New York City. Um, they bought it in 2005. I think that's right, 2005, 2006, somewhere on there. And they paid $30 million for this, which doesn't seem to be a lot of money right now for art because a, a Leonardo painting just sold for, I think it was $350 million. This is only 10% of that. Um, but it is a small little about the size of your notebook paper composition and look at the frame 
scholars believe this is an original 13th century frame because like an object like this was small. It was placed in a home, likely before a shelf where candles were burnt before it and it has scorched part of all of this. When we think of objects like these, one of the things I'm always interested in is who's paying for it? We talked about this, the very first artifact when we like, talked about the Arnolfinis, right? Who's the patron? Who can afford a big, big work like this or like that? And the reality is, I suppose there are some people who could pay for it, but you don't have anywhere to put a nine foot tall my style altarpiece. These were originally placed in churches. These were not the kinds of things that people owned themselves, right? This was the kind of thing that was owned by other kinds of people, by everyday people, right? Like the wealthy merchants and whatnot of their day. This was the kind of thing that they could afford to put into their house. And that's a really important idea. Where are these things going to? Who is keeping them? Who pays for them? And the little things could have ended up in small private homes, but the bigger things would have ended up in places like churches. Duccio and Simebue are wonderfully situated within the early, within the proto Renaissance. And the artist who we'll talk about in Artifact 2 um, is going to be a slight step forward, but but sometimes like artistic styles don't change overnight. And what was once cool um, can come back in fashion a little bit later. And so I want to show you a really fascinating object that's actually in the next museum or the next room in the Uffizi Museum. It's this one. The, the painting is called The Annunciation. Uh, we'll talk about the, the subject in a second. Um, and the art maker is Simone Martini. Now, we call this work early Italian Renaissance, although to be honest with you, that's only because of the year. So to give you an idea, the artist we're gonna talk about for Artifact 2 of this is gonna be this guy, his name Giotto. And, and he's painting from around 1305 to say 1330. And he looks different. There's a sense of roundness of his form and volume that we'll come back to. Simone Martini does not that guy. Instead, this is early Italian Renaissance, mostly because of when it was painted, 1333, rather than what it is we see. So this thing has a sense of flatness, has all of that gold that we've seen before. And this is one of those paintings that when I saw it for the first time, um, I kind of knew more about this painting than I had in you know 10 years studying art history because there's something really magical about seeing works of art in person. So let's talk about who's there and then maybe how this painting has changed over the centuries. So we can think of this as having essentially three separate panels. Panel one, panel two, and the big panel here, panel three. So I wanna spend some time looking at panel three. In panel three, we have this enormous and hopefully benevolent angel with these big, huge gold iridescent wings who has swooped into the room and he's got like this sort of cloak on. I don't know why I called him him a he, angels clearly are not, um, but he or she or it has swooped in and so much so that like his coat is still flapping in the wind. He's holding an olive branch. He's wearing gold. Here is a pot of lilies and here sits Mary who is looking at the, at the angel as if she is not entirely interested in what he is selling. Let me go back to this picture. So she, like the, the New Testament suggests that when, when the angel approached Mary to inform her that she was gonna bear the son of God, she was reading a book. And so here's that book. Now, the words that the angel speaks to Mary form the core of a prayer that every Catholic knows. The prayer is called the Hail Mary. Hail Mary in Latin is Ave Maria. Um, and so we often have like, so the prayer goes, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And then it continues, blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, comma, Jesus. So, so Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is we Blessed is the, the fruit in your womb, which is the baby Jesus. And then the good Catholic part at the end is, 
pray for us sinners now and on the hour of our death. Amen. So, so, I mean, I'm a Catholic uh, riddled with enough Catholic guilt to make it certain that I've said the Hail Mary prayer 10,000 times in my life if I've said it once. And so these are the words that are flying out of the angel's mouth going right towards Mary. Ave gratia plena dominus tecum, right? That is the Latin phrase that shows up in the scripture for Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Now, of course, the angel didn't speak Latin, neither did Mary understand it. But when the Bible was translated into Latin by St. Jerome, there we go. So I give a question for you. First of all, this scene, a scene where the angel comes to Mary to tell her the good news that she is about to bear the Son of God, we call that the Annunciation. And from, a, from Annunciation, we get to announcement, right? That's the English word. The Latin word is Annunciation. It's a like a proclamation, right? So, and, and Mary is wearing, hooray for Mary. She's wearing her red and blue, so you have gold bling trimmed on it. The gold, the angel is wearing gold. And here we have a pot of lilies. And, I'll, and I think the lilies show up here. Lilies are white flowers. White flowers, lilies, are traditionally a symbol of Mary's purity. The angel is holding an olive branch. It's typically a symbol of peace. And I give you a conundrum. Here and there, I suggest to you that these panels were added later. And they're two saints. I don't know who they are. Let's say St. Margaret and St. Anthony. I don't know who they are. I should know, but I don't. So I'm sorry for having failed you today. But I suggest to you that these paintings were added, um, added later. And my question to you is, why do I think that? And how about this? The ground line doesn't match up. Right? They're placed on different ground lines. So it seems to me as if these might have been added later. I don't know that for certain. It's just a good sporting guess. So we think about this painting. It has all of the great hallmarks of a proto-Renaissance art, even though it was made in the early part of the 14th century, actually the middle third of the, the, the 14th century. It has the gold backgrounds, the, the shallow depth of field, I mean, Mary clearly is not interested in having anything to do with this angel or the son of God. But one of the real cool things and the thing that gets me every time I look at these in person or heck, even this today, is the words coming from the angel's mouth. First of all, that's the coolest crown you're going to see today. <laughs> look at the words like here's the word Ave. Do you see the black around the letters? And do you know why that black is there? The reason why that black exists is that these words have been sort of embossed. They've been given a sense of three-dimensionality to it. On my desk here in my, in my office, I have a book embosser. And so if I loan somebody a book, um, and I haven't already done this, on the title page, I will put the sheet in between the embosser, I'll squeeze down and, uh, and, uh, and something will be raised on that page. And I'm pretty certain it says from the library of Brian John Zygmunt. And this is a way for five years from now when someone has forgotten that they've taken my book that they can return it to me. It provides something that once was flat, a sense of three-dimensionality to it. And those dark lines there, those are the shadows created by the raking light coming across all of this. And you might be thinking, whoop de doo Brian, the words have been embossed. But think about this. The most temporary thing until about 130 years ago was sound. Sound. The minute sound was gone, it was gone. You were never going to hear that song sound again. You might hear it reproduced. For example, I can say hello, and I can say hello again, but you'll never hear that same hello again. That's it. It's over. It's gone. The most temporary thing we had was sound. And of course, the record player and your iPad have changed all of that. 
but for the longest time, it was temporary. I mean, think about this, what it means for music. I bet none of you have gone to a concert recently. But 200 years ago, concerts were what people did for fun. It's the only time you heard music was when somebody was playing it for you then. Sound was precious. Sound was dear. Sound was holy. And in this painting, the most tactile thing, the most real thing, the thing you can most reach out and touch, but please don't, <laughs> but the thing you could, are the words. And I think that's a fascinating idea. So that, my friends, wraps up a very quick, but I hope fun, exploration of the kinds of aesthetics we see within the proto-Renaissance. For our next explosion, we're going to do just a little bit of time on Giotto, because Giotto, in some ways, has his feet in both sides of the world. He, as you can see, is a little bit proto-Renaissance and a little bit early Renaissance as well. So this, my friends, is where we pick up next. <music>